many of you will have wondered why we titled this series somewhat awkwardly, though we with giants fight. It actually comes from a hymn, and I'm not trying to make any comment whatsoever about the relative merits of different uh, hymn books here. But this is a little hymn book that I quite a hymn that I quite like from the Green Hymn Book. Who so beset him round with dismal stories do but themselves compound, confound? His strength the more is no lion shall him fright. Though he with giants fight, he will make good his right to be a pilgrim. The second verse of, of a hymn, hymn 348 from the Green. Now, these words were written by uh, a man by the name of Percy Dermer, uh, but he took them from a prior writer called John Bunyan. And some of you may have heard of John Bunyan. He wrote a book called Pilgrim's Progress. Now, we, of course, do not see uh, any similarity between our faith and that which uh, John Bunyan followed. But nonetheless, he wrote a book uh, while he was in prison. He was imprisoned for his faith in England for, I think, about 12 years. And he wrote a story called Pilgrim's Progress, which describes the journey of a so-called Christian um, from the city of destruction to the city of celestial light. What's really interesting about this story is that on the journey, this man Christian, that's his name, clever, isn't it? You can see what he's doing there, uh, passes, well, he passes a number of things, and including them, he passes two dead giants called Pope and Pagan. This man saw Pope and Pagan as ancient giants. And then he proceeds on and he finds himself in the slough of despond dealing with the giant despair and his wife, the giantess diffidence in Doubting Castle. It's an allegory, of course, of, of John Bunyan's own life. And he wrote this, as I said, while enduring a 12-year imprisonment for his faith. And, and doubtless, he saw some of the same sim symbology of the giants that, that we've been looking at. Monsters that grow larger in the dark. And what we want to do this session is finish off our history of the giants, and then we're going to try and circle back to Goliath. And I hope at that point, uh, our subject will get even more meaning for us, meaningful for us, more personal if it hasn't already. Because you see, in some ways, up until now, these have just been stories. Interesting, exciting stories, I hope. But the histories we're kind of able to hear it hold at arm's length. I hope that at the conclusion of our tale, this story tonight will resonate more personally. So, in our last session, we saw the stonefly from David Sling. We heard that sickening smack and we saw the giant fall, as it were, in slow motion, as both on both sides of the valley. We can almost hear that collective intake of breath. <sighs> and that there could have been the end of our series on giants. But it's not. Because it just so happens that there is still one story to be told, and it's our reading, 2nd of Samuel 21, which introduces us to a period that we might call the Giant War. You see, David was not yet done with giants. Verse 16, uh, And Ishbi Benob, which was of the sons of the giants, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. You see, in this particular battle in which David takes her on Ishbi Benob, things don't play out the same way as they did with Goliath. Verse 17, But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, succored David and smote the Philistine and killed him. And then the men of David swear unto him, saying, You shall no more go out before us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. This time, David, the man after God's own heart, couldn't kill the giant, Goliath's brother. And David himself had to be rescued. In fact, as we read through this chapter and, and, and do a bit of research on it, we discover that, giant, uh, that Goliath had, in fact, 
Four brothers. Four brothers. The first of these is Ishbi Benam, who we've just been looking at. His name means he who dwells in the heights. Perhaps this is a, a size joke, you know, like calling someone who's tall lofty. Who knows? The next of these is in verse 18. His name is Saf, whose name, according to Brown, Driver, and Briggs Dictionary, means tall. Again, the same thing, I guess. Then there's Lami. Uh, in verse 19, we read about Lami, but he's actually only named for us in First of Chronicles 20 and verse 5. And then finally, there is their little brother. Verse 20 tells us about him, this man of Gath. Unnamed and very tall, but he's not a true giant like his brothers. He's just called a man of great stature. Now, the first of these giants, Ishbi Benob, is slain by Abishai. Abishai was the chief of David's second tier of mighty men in the catalogue of faith at the end of David's story. The second of these giants was killed by a man called Sibekai, also known as Mabuni, in 2 Samuel 23, verse 27. The um, Mabuni or Sibekai was the eighth in David's cohort of the mighty. The third of these giants was slain by a man called Elhanan. Now, this Elhanan only appears in this context in the story of the slaying of the giant. He never appears in any other context by himself. And the last of these giants is slain by David's little nephew, Jonathan, the son of Shimea. You can almost see a ascending or descending, should I say, scale, can't you? We start with the mightiest of David's mighty men, Abishai, in that, at that top rank of six mighty men. We're followed by one of the 30 we're followed by someone who's mighty but unnamed, and then finally David's little cousin, sorry, little nephew. Which begs the question, how is it that David could slay Goliath, the biggest of them all, far bigger than any of the others, and yet almost die at the hands of another? Yet lesser men were capable of slaying these other giants. Ishbi Spinob's spear, in verse 16 here, is half the weight of Goliath's, presumably because he was half as strong as Goliath. How is it that David handled Goliath but could not take this giant out? But was it David's age? That's, that's certainly how, how Israel viewed it, Come back to that slide in a minute. That's certainly how Israel viewed it. They, they saw it that way. Don't go out to fight before us anymore. But that's not right, is it? Back when David fought Goliath, he was unarmed, almost. He was inexperienced. He was unprepared. Now, in 2 Samuel 21, he's a hardened, armoured veteran of a hundred campaigns. He's wielding a sword. He's still able to wage war, and he's able to keep up with the best. In fact, years from now in the story, Hushai will warn Absalom not to take on David directly, for David was a mighty man, a bear robbed, a man of war. Years from this point in time. So what's going on here? Well, let's ask a slightly different question. Why could David do the impossible in the first place and slay the giant Goliath? Well, because he had been armed with faith and a clean conscience, hadn't he? That's what won the victory. So what's changed? Well, to understand that, we need to put this later war, the giant war, into our chronology and see what came immediately before it. And to do that, we're going to flick across the second of Chronicles, um, sorry, first of Chronicles chapter 20. First of Chronicles 20 and verse 4. 
where it says, And it came to pass after this that there arose a war at Giza with the Philippines, Philipp, the Philistines. First of Chronicles 20 verse 4. At which time Sibachai, the Hushathite, uh, slew Sippai, that was of the children of the giant, and they were subdued. And it goes on to tell us about Elhanan killing Lami and the war at Gath with another man of giant stature and so on and so on. This is the same story. The same events are here recorded in 1st of Chronicles chapter 20 as we read in 2nd of Samuel chapter 21. But, but one battle is actually left out. There's no mention in the Chronicles record of the battle with Ishbi Benob. And we'll see why by and by, I think. So what was it that came immediately before the giant war? Well, verse 1 dead, obviously. We're in verse 4. Let's look at verse 1. And it came to pass that after the year was expired at the time that kings go out to battle, Joab led forth the power of the army and wasted the country of the children of Ammon and came and besieged Reba. But David tarried at Jerusalem and Joab smote Reba and destroyed it. David tarried at Jerusalem. Does anyone know what happened? At that time, as David tarried at Jerusalem. I'm hearing whispers. Bathsheba, exactly right. Uh, gold star later for Kate, thank you for that. Uh, the, the, the sin of David with Bathsheba occurs in that interval, uh, really where that full stop is after, but David tarried at Jerusalem. David's sin with Bathsheba and the betrayal in battle of Uriah occurred between verse 1 and verse 2. In other words, David's fight with Ishbi Benob, which should happen just before verse 4, happened hard on the heels of his failure and crime and during the period when he is, is still unreconciled to Bathsheba. His conscience is tainted. His spiritual armor is in disrepair. His faith is at low ebb and he fought his own personal giant. His wandering eyes, his, des his desire to cover his sin and he lost that battle and he needed to be rescued first by Nathan the prophet who said unto him, you are the man. And then by Abishai. But Chronicles, perhaps out of respect for David and for all David's goodness, the man after God's own heart, omits David's faults. If you go through Chronicles, you and it is a pro, it's a parallel record to, to Samuel, you'll see that it omits his quarrel with Michal. It omits his sin with Bathsheba and this. It omits his defeat by Ishbi Benob and his rescue by one who was named Abishai. Abishai, well, his, his name means the father of gifts. Brothers and sisters, the giants of our past often make havoc of our present. And so it was with David. A giant of sin had stalked him and still stalked him from Jerusalem and on. And almost he fell, almost he perished. But were it not for the gift of the Father, the gift of God. And so David failed to defeat all of the giants and this task was left to other lesser men. Which brings us neatly to our next thought, I think. 
Because just as the story of David's rescue by Abishai spoke, spoke of more than just a lucky escape, so too David's battle with Goliath speaks of much more than just a victory over a giant. For Goliath stands in the record for sin at its most awe-inspiring and powerful. Goliath stands for, for a sin that dwarfs faith, that dwarfs conscience, that dwarfs good intention and goodwill and leaves even the best of mankind hoping for a way out. Like King Sin, the serpent, Goliath, lied. Come back to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 9. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 9. And here's what Goliath said as he climbed down to the valley's floor to scream up at the camp of Saul. He said, 1 Samuel 17, 9, If he be able to fight with me, your champion that is, and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. The Philistine had no intention of becoming Israel's servant. Whatever the outcome of this battle. And that's no difference to sin. Sin promises to help us. Sin promises in our life to serve us. But inevitably, and we know this from personal bitter experience, sin only ever makes us slaves. For to be carnally minded is death, says the apostle. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. The carnal mind is at war against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. It can never, ever be a servant to God. We will be your slaves. No, you won't. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves slaves to obey, his slaves ye are to whom you obey? Sin, Goliath, or obedience unto righteousness? Sin inevitably makes us slaves. It just cannot ever be a servant to God. And we were told in the story of Goliath that Goliath drew near evening and morning, morning and evening for 40 days. Verse 16, the giant drew near morning and evening. To draw near happens to be a phrase that has religious tones, if you like. To draw near to God is a way this phrase is commonly used. And Goliath deliberately chose to draw near to the camp of Israel at the time of their morning and their evening prayers. The giant chose that specific moment that he might invade their thoughts, that he might storm their supplications, that he might sow doubt and taint devotion. And for 40 days, for a lifetime, as it were, of testing and of judgment, the giant stormed their prayers. And on the screen is, is just a summary of, of the ways that 40 days is used to represent a lifetime a probationary period of, of suffering and of tribulation. We noticed last session that Goliath was protected by a coat of mail, of scales. And that's a word that, outside this story, is only ever used of scales in the animal kingdom. There's no other occasion where it describes a, a coat of scale or anything like that. It's only here in this story and everywhere else where this word does service for the scales of an animal. It appears here in Ezekiel 29 and verse 3. Behold, I'm against the Pharaoh king of Egypt, the great 
dragon who comes up out of the river with fish stuck to his scales, a serpent, a vast dragon, scaled like Goliath, a warrior dressed like a snake. Like a snake. And these scales that we read of in, in second of, uh, first of Samuel chapter 17 and, and verse 5, that coat of scales, well, they, they were of brass. Now the Hebrew word for brass to a, a Jewish ear, it sounds very, very much like the word for serpent. These two words sound quite similar to, to a Jewish ear. And, and that fact, the fact that the word for brass and the word for serpent have a similarity to a Jewish speaker and, well, an event in the wilderness wanderings, these two things tied these two words together in the Jewish mind. In the Jewish mind, the brass... Serpent was given, if you like, a pet name, a nickname, Nehushtan. A, a word that was comprised of compressing these two words, brass and serpent, into one compound name. And so in the Jewish mind, brass and snakes go together. Brass and snakes, they're related, they're connected, it's natural. Not only is the record working very hard to point out that Goliath is a giant of sin. He's clad like a snake. He's in the brass of flesh. He lies. It's working very hard to make that point. The record is also leading us towards sin's greatest adversary. The record is really drawing us to Christ. The stone rejected by the builders and his battle with sin in Gethsemane. Oh, and we know this, don't we? That Gethsemane comes from two words. One for the wine press and the other for its juice or its fluid. The wine or the blood of the press. And yet the garden that Christ battled in his mind within was called Gath. Semene. Blood from Gath. And it was on the way to this very garden that the Lord commanded his disciples to get swords. And he was told that they had two swords. He commanded them to get swords. And they said, look, we've got two, two swords. You know, amazingly, in the record in Samuel, the very same point is made. We're told in the story in Samuel that swords were in short supply in Saul's army and that in all of Saul's military machine, there were but two swords. David, uh, sorry, Jonathan's and Saul's. Saul's sword would be offered to David and was rejected just as our Lord rejected the sword too, when he said to Peter, put up your sword into the sheath, the cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? And on the way out of the upper room, after Judas' departure, the mood, as we know, of that celebration changed. The shadows grew and loomed, and the giants, as it were, crept closer. And the Lord warned of those whom Satan desired to have. And he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you. As wheat. And as the fear loomed and grew among the eleven who remained, the Lord responded to that fear and said, This Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? 
Verily I say unto you, the cock will not crow till you have denied me thrice. This is a direct continuation on the Lord's comment to Peter about Satan's desire for him. And the Lord finishes with this phrase, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe ye in God. Believe also in me. These words are almost word for word the same as what David said to Saul in 1 Samuel 17 verse 32 where David said, Let no man's heart fail because of this giant. Let not your heart be troubled. And so the eleven and our Lord came into the garden where the Lord would battle an ancient giant in his mind. And it says in Luke 22 verse 41 that he was withdrawn from them about the stones cast where he kneeled down and prayed. Why does it say this, a stone's cast, if not to pull our minds back, back, to draw the threads tight as two stories are knit together, one man troubled and worn, pleading in a garden, and on the other side of the record, a youth in a valley armed with five small river-smooth stones. Five books of the Pentateuch, five Philistine cities, five giants. It matters not, for it only took one, the stone the builders rejected, to draw, destroy the giant, sin. And so the rock flew. The giant fell. And then in verse 51 of 1 Samuel 17, we read, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took a sword and drew it out of his sheath and slew him and cut off his head therewith. Why did he stand on him? David knew he was involved in something greater. Genesis 3.15, it shall bruise the serpent's head. And he stood there on a giant sin, clad in serpent scales. Corinthians, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. They will all be put under him. Hebrews, citing Psalms. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his... David knew. Perhaps for him the image was not as clear as it is for us, but he stood, the bruised foot crushing the snake's, the snake-clad giant's head, and then he cut it off. Again, why? Was that a normal Israelite victory ritual? Like scalping an, an, an enemy? No. As far as I know, only one other person in the Bible had their head cut off in battle. And that was an act of desperation. Here in this story, Goliath was already dead. And, and what David does here, this is not normal. This is not what Israelites do in battle. So why did he do it? Verse 54. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. Somehow. David already knew that Jerusalem was going to be important. At this point in time, Jerusalem is not in Jewish hands. 
It's in the hands of the Jebusites who later will stand on its walls and mock him. But David somehow already knew that this was the place where God's name, the name of the living God, would be enshrined, where the most significant events in all of history would, would occur. And so he took Goliath's head there. Not inside. Jerusalem was still close to him at this point in time, but, but near it. And I, I've got a sneaking suspicion that Golgotha, the place of the skull, a name that sounds uncannily like a contraction of Goliath of Gatha. And I know I'm just pulling that one out of thin air, but it sounds like it, doesn't it? I, I, I have a real suspicion that that was where David took that head. The very place, Gethsemane, for where the stone was launched that struck the giant's sin, the giant would fall at Golgotha. And Christ, our David, won victory for every man, for all Israel that day. Goliath speaks of sin personified. The giant defeated in a titanic struggle in a garden. But woven into this scripture is another prophecy too. Another image of Christ's battles. Not this time with sin within, but sin without. Sin enthroned in the kingdom of men. In Revelation chapter 13, we're told, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, of sinful humanity. His number is 666. The number of sinful of humanity, of, of humanity that defies the living God is 666. And you know what? Amazingly, this same number is scored into the record of Goliath. We saw back in verse 4 of this chapter, 1st of Samuel 17, verse 4, that our giant was six cubits tall. Frighteningly tall. His, the, the, the top of his his military-style crew cut, scraping the ceiling if he stood on the floor down there. Six cubits tall. And we saw that his spear, verse 7, was 600 shekels of iron. And he was armed with six pieces of armament. Go through and count them. There's the helmet. There's the coat of scales, there's the greaves, there's a target or a short sword, there's a spear, and there's a shield. Six. And the record is working hard to make sure we see these three sixes, six, 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 to make sure that comes through clearly to us. Because you know what? Goliath actually had seven weapons. He also carried with him a long sword, yet this is not mentioned here in these verses so that we can spot the 666. And I want you to notice something else. Now in verse 34, look at what it says here. It says, And David said unto Saul, Your servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And in verse 36, David says, your servant slew both the lion and bear and this uncircumcised Philistine. He's the same. He's like the lion. Goliath is like the lion, like the bear. You know, there's something interesting in these verses. Two animals took one lamb. A lion and a bear took a lamb. And David says, Goliath, one man, is like them too. He's like a lion bear or a bear lion. Well, where have we seen a lion and a bear together before? We know where. 
Daniel chapter 7. The beasts pouring their way up out of the filthy sea of nations, one like a lion, one like a bear. Revelation 13. Again, the beast of the sea. This time, all of the animals compressed into one, and it's a lion bear or a bear lion, although there happens to be a bit of leopard and dragon in there as well. The scripture is pulled together, the lion and the bear, just as David does here in this story. And David said he was attacked by a lion and a bear. Young's literal says, The lion hath come and the bear. They came together, they took one lamb and they united in David's description. He describes them as him, the lion bear, two predators united in one. And we're told in the story that Goliath, the man like the lion bear, is clad in brass and iron. Brass and iron. We know what their symbols are. They, they're symbols of Greece and of Rome. Daniel chapter 2. The image's head was of gold, its breast and arms of silver, but his belly and thighs were of brass, his legs of iron. Here in this one man, we have emblems of all the kingdoms of men that would come. The lion and the bear, the iron and the brass. But, but, but why not... Lion, bear, leopard, unnamed beast. Or, or why not he was wearing a gold bracelet and a silver earring and he had iron swords and brass, whatever it is. Why are the symbols mixed and split? Well, these symbols in this mix are united in one image in prophecy. The great beast... And I say that in the singular because it is one beast of Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 13 and 17. Describe animals that unite these symbols. Iron and brass, lion and bear. And this here, the the beast of Daniel 7, Revelation 13, is a beast that would last from the time of our Lord's, Lord's first advent all the way through to his final return. When Daniel says that the ancient of days will come and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. This beast possessed the doctrine, the the, the mouth of the Babylonian lion. It it possessed the strength and the feet of the Persian bear. It possessed the dreadful tearing claws of Greece and the fangs of iron of Rome, all in one giant-sized, world-spanning, 2,000-year-old foe. And in 1 Samuel 17, verse 48, it makes a rather odd point about Goliath. It says this, And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came to draw nigh to meet David. Arose. Had Goliath been lying down before this? No, but you see, this man who speaks of the image empire of human defiance is an image that stands up, stands up in the latter days only to be struck by a pebble cut out of the mountain without hands. O king, you saw us and behold a great image which stood up before you. The form was terrible. Daniel 2 witnesses this same giant struggle up from the ground onto its feet and stand momentous before him. And in Daniel 7, the same beast, the final beast that encompasses all the rest of the beasts, the one that devours and is made of lion and of bear and has fangs of iron and claws of brass, it had another feature 
I'm not going to turn to Daniel 7, but we'll put it up on the screen. It had another feature. It had a horn that spoke against God and against the saints. A horn that spoke against God and against the saints. And 1 Samuel 17 and verse 43 tells us, it tells us that Goliath cursed David. It says in our Bible, the, the, the King James, by his gods. But that's, that's not right. It's not plural, it's singular. He did not curse David by Goliath's gods, but by his, by David's God. He used God's name. He used the Yahweh name to curse the saints and he spoke against the Most High. And, and when that stone finally strikes the image man in 1 Samuel 17, and David cut off his head, his rosh in the Hebrew, his carcass, we're told, was left to the birds of the air and the beasts of the fields, as David had promised in verse 46. And that's exactly what it says will happen to the great enemy of Christ at the time of the end. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, I'm against you. O Gog, the, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, you will fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your bands and the people that is with thee, and I'll give you to the ravenous birds of every sort. The same things are said here. In fact, you know what? The Septuagint, the Bible that predominantly is cited in the New Testament, the Greek Old Testament, says this in Ezekiel chapter 32. A future, a prophecy of the future. It says, there were laid Meshach and Tubal and all his strength round about in his tomb. Here Ezekiel is, vi is visualizing a future in which the enemy who falls on the mountains of Israel in Ezekiel 38 is now in the grave. And he goes on to say, all his slain men, all the circumcised, uncircumcised, slain with the sword, who caused, listen to these words, their fear to be in the land of the living. Not the land of the Raphaim, the land of the living. And they are laid with the giants that fell of old. Meshach and Tubal are here put in direct parallel with the giants of the past. The out Outcome of this conflict is in no doubt either. The outcome of the conflict to come in which Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, the Pope and all of their allies stand in defiance against God, the outcome of that battle is in no doubt because like David's battle, this is not a fair fight. This battle soon to arrive will be no more of a conflict than David's and Goliath's, than David's war was. Verse 47, all this assembly shall know that Yahweh saves not with a sword and a spear. Doesn't matter how big your army is. The battle is Yahweh's. This battle was and always will be God's. It's his battle. It's his victory. It will be his glory. Exodus 15, Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. Joel 3, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The day of Yahweh is near. And finally, Zechariah, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations 
as when he fought in the day of battle. This will be his battle, his war. And it's not a fair fight. I think we can be very confident of the Spirit's intent in recording this story this way. David speaks here of our Lord without question. Ezekiel 37, surprisingly the chapter that comes before Ezekiel 38, the valley of dry bones says this, and David my servant shall be king over them and they shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And my servant shall be their prince for ever. A united Israel resurrected on the mountains of Israel, having defeated the mighty northern army, led by none other than David. But this David, it's the latter day David. Goliath speaks of the giant sin, both within and without. Defeated first at Golgotha and last on the mountains of Israel in the latter days. And David speaks of our Lord. Way back when we started this talk, so very many hours ago it must feel, we said that David failed to defeat all the giants. And he left that to others. Except that's not what the record says. These were born unto the giant in Gath. And they fell by the hand of David. And by the hand of his servants. The record, inspired by the Father, gives us a final conclusion, doesn't it? That David and his friends, in the end, strengthened by God to stand against all fear and terror, defeated the giants together. And who are the latter-day servants of the latter-day David? Let's bring this passage forward. David and his companions defeated the giants. The fellas, the Nephilim, fell before them. And just as God split the world to bring Nimrod down, just as God gave an aged Moses strength to smite Og in his stronghold, just as God blessed Caleb with victory in Hebron and David and his servants with the, the, the defeat of the giants, so God is invested in our battles too, brothers and sisters. And in every one of these stories, there has been a common element, and it's this. Literal giants never troubled men of strong faith. And when we walk with God, it's not a fair fight. Let's finish in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6 and... Verse 10. Finally, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might by putting on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers in the darkest place in the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, against sin in our minds. 
Wherefore, take unto you, brothers and sisters, the whole armour of God, that we may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand.